we can be turning to Romans chapter 4. We will look at verses 9 through 12 today, Lord, one. Previously, if you recall, we looked at how that Abraham believed God and was counting him for righteousness. Amen. And then we saw how the blessings that come with that, how the, we are blessed by having this imputed righteousness, and we're blessed by having our iniquities and sins forgiven and covered, and that the Lord no longer imputes this sin to our account because he imputed it to Christ's account. Amen. And all the blessings that go with that. And verse 9, we pick up here, continuing on the same topic, the same thought here. He says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, the right, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Mm. Too bad. We will be talking a bit about circumcision today and Abraham. But he begins by saying, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only. Who are these blessings that we looked at that David described in the Psalms? Are they only for the, the circumcised, only those who, who are the children of Israel, or the children of Abraham, the Israelites in particular? That's his first first part of this question that he asked here, is it you know, are these blessings only for them? And then a for about 2,000 years, those blessings were primarily for them. Right. Aside from a few exceptions, the Jews, the children, the children of Abraham, they were the ones who partook of these blessings. Mm -hmm. But that's not so for us today, as it says in the next part, or upon the uncircumcision also. And I said this is the blessedness of the truth for us today, that these blessings can also come upon us. That these, this imputed righteousness, as we call it, this forgiveness of sins, this covering of sins, this can be also to the Gentiles, the, the heathen nations, the uncircumcision, as it's called. We, I know that circumcision as a medical procedure is practiced in our Western culture, but if you recall, in Paul's day, it was not. Right. It was just to those who were descendants of Abraham. And also to the Ishmaelites and the other, his other offspring, they practiced it as well. But to our people, to the Gentiles, it was not a practice that was very common. Right. If you recall, Timothy was not circumcised, and there was some dispute about that. So Paul went ahead and had him circumcised to please the Jews. To know the blessings of Christ's imputed righteousness also comes upon those who were of the uncircumcision, those who are the Gentiles. And we have a lot to rejoice in that because that's who we are as a people. Amen. And he goes on to say, For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. That it was his faith that was counted for righteousness or imputed for righteousness, as we saw in verse 3. Abraham believed God was counting him for righteousness. Notice it doesn't say anything about his circumcision there. It's faith and faith alone that brings about this righteousness. Amen. And that's what he's kind of bringing out in this text here today, that faith is what's counted for righteousness, not any external work. Amen. Verse 10, we'll go on. He says, how was it then reckoned? Or at what point in Abraham's life was it said that his faith was counted for righteousness? We can turn back to Genesis 15, and we'll spend a little bit of time over Genesis looking at this.
Genesis 15. You go ahead and read the first seven verses to get the whole context here, but if you're not familiar with what was going on, Abraham and Lot had left their home country and had went their separate ways. At the end of chapter 13 there, they went their separate ways, Lot, you know, looking for the well water plains of Jordan. But then chapter 14, one of the lesser talked about events in Lot's life, Solomon, Gomorrah, and some other round about them were at war, and Lot was taken captive, so Abraham right. went to save him. And then at the end of the chapter, after the, that was complete, King of Salem, Melchizedek appears, and Abraham and him have that interaction, which we read about how it's Christ is the priest at the order of Melchizedek. My bad. And we pick up here in verse number one of chapter 15. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought forth, brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And here's the key, verse 16. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted to him for righteousness. Amen. And he said unto him, that's God said to Abram, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. But we know from just here that this was after he left Ur the Chaldees and had made his way towards Canaan. And this is where he's told he will be given the land of Canaan. Here. <clears throat> Abraham had not yet been circumcised, as we'll see in the next part. We don't have to turn back there, but our text in Romans 4 next says, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. He asked the question, when was when did Abraham have this faith that was counted in righteousness? Was he circumcised or was he uncircumcised? Well, the covenant of circumcision wasn't given until Genesis chapter 17. We can turn over there real quick. I want to see a couple things here. Genesis 17, verses 9 through 14 is where the covenant is given. It says, And God said unto Abraham, Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is Genesis 17, 9. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and between me and you, and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall be ye shall circumcise the flesh of your force and it shall be a covenant of, or a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house and bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in Thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must need to be circumcised, and my covenant shall be with your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh is not, whose flesh of his fortune is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from him, or from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Mm -hmm. Here, the two chapters later, after he believes God, is when the covenant is given. Right. Now, for context, Abraham was 75 when he left Canaan, or left for Canaan. Uh, Genesis 12, 4 tells us that. Yeah. And he, I believe, arrived shortly after that in the land of Canaan. That's when we see the events of Genesis 13 and 14 occur. And somewhere between there and 10 years later is when Genesis 15 occurs. Right. Because uh, we don't have to turn there, but Genesis. 16.3 tells us that it was after they'd been in Canaan 10 years when Sarah gave Hagar to be his right. handmaid to go in and have a son with Hagar. And at the age of 86, he has 
Ishmael. And then if you look at verse 1 of chapter 17 here, it says, And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram. Ooh. Here when he's given the covenant of circumcision, he's 99 years old. Right. And if you go down to verse 23, is when the covenant is carried out, it says, And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were brought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin, the self same day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the self same day was Abraham circumcised Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Amen. Here, the same day it says that God gave him the covenant, he carried out that, his part of the covenant. He was 99 years old. Abraham being, or Ishmael being 13, so. Right. It would have been at least 14, and up to 24 years since it was written that he believed God and was counting him for righteousness. Amen. That's a long time difference. Mm -hmm. We see that proves that it was not of circumcision that saved him. Uh, we go back to our text. Paul answers the question that he asked was it in circumcision or uncircumcision? And he says, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Just as we just saw there in Genesis, that his faith was counted for righteousness long before he was ever circumcised. Amen. Anywhere from 14 to 24 years before, in fact. And that's just today. It's faith and not baptism that is counted for our righteousness. Many today say that you have to be baptized to be saved or some other work. You have to join this church or do this or do that. But we see for Abraham, it was his faith was counted long before anything else came into play. And it is just the same day that his faith that is counted for righteousness apart from any of these other works that we can do. Mm -hmm. There is a many parallels between baptism and circumcision, but they are not the same. And baptism did not replace circumcision. Amen. I want to bring that out here in our next couple of verses. But just as Abraham was uncircumcised when he believed, Mm -hmm. Really, today it's the same as one is unbaptized when they believe. Right. Now, some may get wet, but they cannot practice biblical baptism until they believe. Amen. Verse 11, back in our text in Romans 4, it says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteous of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. It seems like a, a mouthful, but it's. This circumcision was a seal or a token or a proof, if you will, that it authenticated and confirmed the faith which he already had. Mm -hmm. It's the same as when a king seals his letter before he sends it off. We don't do that anymore, but in that day when a king or someone of authority would write a letter and they would put their seal upon it, that it would not be opened. Until right. after the right recipient, it showed authenticity and authority, and that's all that circumcision did. It was a sign that Abraham had been sealed by faith, and it was a sign given to his fleshly seed and to those who would be his offspring, and it identified them with the people of God. Amen. Notice here, Paul reaffirmed that circumcision was a sign of the faith which he already had. It was not the cause of the faith which he had. It was not the cause of his justification. It was not what made him right with God. Rather, it was just an outward sign of his inward faith. Amen. And that sounds much like what we say about baptism today. Doesn't Amen. It? Baptism is a sign that we are have faith. It identifies us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
it produces no faith in itself, but it is a result of our faith. Amen. The difference being that circumcision was given to Abraham's physical seed, and baptism is given to the spiritual seed. That gets into our next point here in just a minute. So I think that's where the pedo baptisms are called, the baby baptizers, they get things right. mixed up. They replace circumcision with baptism, and they say, well, we've got to baptize our infants so they can be part of the covenant. Hmm. But carnal thinking always leaves a carnal result, doesn't it? That's much like Abra or, excuse me, Nicodemus. He's, Christ said he must be born again. He's carnally thinking, he said, well, how do I get back in my mother's womb and be born again? Right. Mm -hmm. No, baptism is a sign of the new covenant, but it's not a fleshly promise like circumcision was. No, it's a promise to those who have been born again. It's a promise to those who are partakers of the new covenant. If anything, I think uh, the permanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit more replaces circumcision than baptism does. We don't have to turn to Ephesians one thirteen tells us that the Holy Spirit is what we are sealed by today. The Holy Spirit is our, is our seal, much like circumcision was their seal. Bad. Yeah. No, we don't have to get all into how God dealt differently with different people and different dispensations, but it's always been of faith, but they didn't have the permanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit. If I understand it right, he came and he, he went as he pleased. That's why David prayed, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Amen. But no, we have that seal of the Holy Spirit today, and circumcision is not of the flesh anymore, is what Romans 2 tells us. No, he goes on to say in the next part of that verse that he had this sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Amen. Now, this is where some Messianic Jews and the Hebrews type people get their support for that all believers must be physical descendants of Abraham, but again, they're thinking <coughs> carnally. Right. And Paul is speaking in a spiritual sense here. Well, I don't think any of us are physical descendants of Abraham. I certainly can't prove it if we were. Right. I know the ten tribes were scattered abroad, so I guess it's possible we could have some lineage back there somewhere, but I have no proof of it. Amen. But no, he is talking in the spiritual sense that Abraham right. is our father through Christ. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 16. It says, And now to Abraham... And his seed, where the promise was made, he saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Amen. Here we're told that the promises were intended to come through Christ, not, not necessarily through his physical descendants, but through Amen. Christ himself, who would be of the lineage of Abraham. He dropped down to verse number 29. And in the meantime, he tells us about the law and its purpose and how that we have faith and faith in Christ and we are children of God by faith. Verse 26 says, and then verse 29 says, and if you be Christ, so then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. We are... Abraham's seed. We are, he is our father in the type that, or in the sense that he, we had the same faith that he had. Amen. In the same fashion that he believed God was coming to righteousness, so it is for us today. Yeah. And that is the sense that he is our father spiritually. Not, certainly he is not God the Father or anything like that. 
but he is not our physical father like he was to the Jews. But in faith, he is our father. He is our our head, if you will. Same type of way that Abraham was saved, we are saved today. Amen. And if I understand what Paul is saying, Galatians, right? We have this. We can lay claim to those same promises that Abraham was given because we are his seed by faith. Because those promises were given to Christ and we are in Christ. Amen. Now I know it said Abraham gave before the sacrifice and all that had come to pass, but it doesn't change that faith was required and faith is still required today. Amen. Going back to Romans 4 verse 11, he says, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. Well, here, physical circumcision doesn't matter when it comes to spiritual things. You know, the Jews were the circumcision, and the Gentiles at this time were the uncircumcision. But what is Paul saying in Galatians 6.15? In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Amen. Romans 2.29 tells us that Circumcision is that which is of the heart. That physical circumcision doesn't matter anymore. Whether you are or whether you aren't, it's whether you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. That makes Amen. And in that sense, in the sense that we have faith, Abraham is our father. That doesn't mean we should walk around like you and say, we have Abraham our father. They were thinking carnally. They thought that just because they descended from Abraham that they had some special blessing. But we'll see in verse 12 that wasn't quite the case. No, whether we be circumcised, whether we not be circumcised, whether we be male, whether we be female, none of those things matter in Christ. But what matters is you're a new creature in Christ. Amen. He says in the last part of verse 11, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. That just as Abraham believed God was counted unto righteousness, so it is for us today that by faith we have that imputed righteousness of God. We've been talking a lot about that in the last several lessons here, but that is the only way to have righteousness in the sight of God is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul brings that out in Philippians as well when he says, if he wanted to be found not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. So the only way to stand right before God is by faith. That's the example we're given in Abraham, and it's still the mode today. Amen. I said there was, there's those who teach you can to be baptized or join this church or do this or give this amount of money or make sure you confess to the priest, the Pope, or whoever it is. No, over and over again, the scriptures affirm that it's by faith are you saved. Amen. New baptism certainly is a sign of a new covenant, but it doesn't save any more than circumcision saved. That's right. Baptism is an important thing for the new for believers today, just as circumcision was important for the Jews in their day. But yet, none of those things matter without first having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> just as Abraham was saved, in, if you will, in his uncircumcision, so are we today saved apart from any other work. Verse 12. Paul goes on to say, speaking still of Abraham, and he says, And the father of circumcision to them who were not of the circumcision only. And in the same sense, Abraham is our spiritual father to the, the Gentiles, the uncircumcision. He is also to the Jews, the circumcision, but not simply because they are circumcised. And he says in the next part, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. The faith has always been the key. Amen. You notice when Paul was in Philippians was kind of 
boasting about things or telling the things he could boast about in the flesh. He says, one of them was circumcised the eighth day. He, he was a Jew of Jews, if you will. Mm -hmm. He kept really every part of the ritualistic part of the Jewish religion down to a T. But, you know, without faith, none of those things mattered. He says he counts them all but dumb that he should win Christ. Right. And all those Jews from Abraham on to the time of Christ, it was good and right that they would be circumcised according to the covenant, but if they didn't have faith, then they were not saved at all. And if they didn't have the same type of faith that Abraham had, then spiritually speaking, he was not their father. Amen. Well, physically speaking, he was, but spiritually, they were their father, the devil, as Christ calls him out in John chapter 8. He said, You are of your father, the devil, and the deeds of your father, you will do. So, faith is the key. It always has been the key. Amen. Abraham is our example of that, and it hasn't changed even to the day current day but yes there are signs of the covenant that are important but those are not what save a person amen I said that's where the what we call pedo baptists get get it wrong if they think that they can baptize their babies then I'll make them part of the covenant hmm. no that's why we were named Anabaptists or Baptizers again because we practice believers' baptism. They, Amen. That one must first have faith and they are baptized. And so it is with was with Abraham. He was first first he had faith and then he was circumcised later on. That's right. And even though the Jews who practice circumcision according to the man of God, their circumcision didn't matter if they didn't have faith. So the Jews weren't just saved because they were Jews or because they practiced the law or because they were circumcised. They were saved because they had faith. Amen. And it's really the same today with baptism. One is not saved because they are baptized. They are saved because they have faith. Faith. Well, sometimes we, we talk a lot about grace, but we can't leave off that faith is the means by which God brings salvation. You know, we'll, we're going in our next lesson. We'll continue on about the promises that come through Abraham. And then we'll talk some about the law and how, how it affects the promises, if you will. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and close with that thought. I just want to remind everyone that faith is the important thing. Amen. <laughs>